uh, Liz Darby and um, and um, Angela Nicholson from um, the Marin County um, Offices of Emergency Assistance and uh, Fair Housing, and I am going to turn it over to them. So I'm not hearing any audio right now. Good morning, Angela. Good morning. I was trying to find my unmute button, but I found it. Me too. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, happy to be here. Um, happy to engage with the One Tim community. I'm Angela Nicholson, and I'm the Assistant County Administrator for the County of Marin, and I'm also have been um, running the Director of the Emergency Operations Center for the County of Marin over the last since um, March of this year, and happy to be here in partnership with my um, partner in crime, um, Liz Darby, um, who is a social equity program and policy coordinator in the community development organization, but we work across silos routinely and are um, regularly working on equity work in Marin County and happy to talk today about some of the inequities um, that we've clearly known about prior to COVID and some of the things that have become even more clear I think um, connecting to Jose's comments earlier about what COVID has shown us and then really what we're doing about it and, um, and just some thoughts about moving the lessons that we have learned over the, the last few months that we want to share with you. So happy to be here. I'm going to turn it over to Liz. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I, you know, Jose was singing my song because in, in the Community Development Agency, I work on housing and we always start our conversations about the fact that there were government policies and practices that created our segregated communities and the impacts on those decisions continue today. And while I'm not gonna always revert back to housing, which I think is probably my favorite subject to talk about, we're gonna talk about equity in the county um, in general this morning. And some of you may be aware, um, uh, well, before I even go that far, we're gonna be talking about two areas of the county uh, that I hope uh, most of you are familiar with. One is Marin City, Marin City is located uh, between Sausalito and Mill Valley. If you're going down the 101 towards San Francisco, it's the community on the right-hand side. Um, there's now a Target at the Gateway Shopping Center. When you get off the exit, you'll see in front of you our public housing uh, development. It's our only family public housing community in Marin County um, and is in, in historically has been primarily an African-American community. The demographics have shifted recently and they're shifting even more today. Um, but that's one of our, what we consider our underserved communities of color. The other one is um, a community that Jose referred to and that is the canal section of San Rafael. Um, it is where our Latinx, primarily large Latinx population resides. Um, it is also uh, fraught with a lot of challenges um, there. Um, and one of the things that I always like to point out around the housing perspective is while we have a large population of Latinx there and the housing stock requires people to be living in severely overcrowded conditions, which Angela will be talking about later today. Um, the one thing that one we should know is that housing is more expensive than housing in other parts of San Rafael. And the reason that is and the difference between um, the housing affordability, let's say in um, the county, excuse me, Marin City, is that is kind of publicly subsidized housing. There's a lot of publicly subsidized housing. In the canal, that's market rate housing. So often people who are living in under overcrowded conditions are also paying more to live there. Okay, let me fast forward here. In 2017, some of you may be familiar with the race counts data. Um, and that was put out by the Advancement Project in, in, in California. And it named Marin County the number one, just a second, Angela, the number one most racially disparate 
a county in California, which is, of course, you know, quite an auspicious designation, but it is one that the county has really focused on, listened to, and tried to make changes. Uh, that said, since 2017, the county has uh, done and initiated several programs that began to address the disparities. Um, and while the county can actually take some credit in claiming some success for it um, before COVID, uh, we're still seeing large groups of disparities in some key areas. Next slide. Let's take a look first about um, our graduation awards. Let's just talk about education. As you can see from this slide, for our high school graduates, there's a 10% difference between white and African American students who graduate, and over 16% between our white and Latinx. Next slide. And while only 7.6% of Marin County residents live below the federal poverty level, residents living in Marin City and the Canal experience poverty at more than three times that rate. And if you drill down into the Canal area of San Rafael, we have different tracks. Um, and you can see that the Pickleweed area, which is the area that has a lot of overcrowded housing, in our developments there, and also have really strong impacts on the cost of housing in that area. Um, their rates are significantly higher. Next slide. And what creates a lot of disparities in Marin County, I always believe, is the cost of housing. Now, this is 2017 data, but uh, in 2017, it, the average house uh, in Marin County was over a million dollars. I believe, and Angela, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to the 2020 numbers that I heard like last month was a million three. But let's just round off numbers, okay? A million dollars. That would have required you to have over $200,000 as a down payment, generally speaking, and that's cash, right? That's not rolled into anything. $200,000 as a down payment, and in order to have a fixed, uh, I can't do this, but the, uh, you'd have to have an annual income of over $220,000 to qualify for a 30-year fixed mortgage. But that same house back in 2017, um, the average income was only, well not only, was 135,000. So most people who were living in their own homes couldn't afford to even buy their own. Now what's even more interesting is HUD, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, puts out annual income limits for families to qualify to live in affordable housing developments and who qualify for Section 8 vouchers. And every year, the Bay Area has a number that we look at and that we look at and we say, for a family of four, you can earn up to this amount and you qualify for any of our affordable housing programs. And this year, for 2020, I'm going to read this number to you. An average family of four can earn up to $143,100 to qualify for an affordable housing for a section. $143,000, i am not sure how many in this audience, makes $143,000 uh, a year, but that's what you have to, you can earn up to, to qualify for a section eight thousand. Next slide. We also know that in Marin, pollution, air quality, and storm-related flooding is a burden on our low-income communities uh, more than any other communities in Marin. And we saw that in that first presentation on the slide. The, the areas that were designated were like uh, the San Rafael area, the Canal area, and um, Southern Marin, which is where Marin City resides. Um, a lot of our communities of color um, have older housing stock which includes kind of old windows, you know, that affect the quality of air in their homes. And then you add to it, right, uh, the uh, temperatures that are rising and the air quality that we've got, we've been experiencing as a, uh, as a result of the fires. Many of our housing developments do not have air conditioning in it. And even if they did, that would be create another kind of financial burden on energy costs. Um, and even more so if they're living in households that don't have energy efficient appliances or materials in which that, you know, the building was built. Um, just so you know, the life expectancy for residents of Marin County is over 85 years old. And yet in the canal area, it is nine years less. The average life expectancy is 76 years of age. And prior to um, COVID, 
we certainly were aware that families of color did not have the same access to the internet as many other families in Marin, and that the digital divide actually affected their students' abilities to access and achieve well in school, and for adults to access opportunities and services for employment, benefits, and other information. Angela? Great, thanks Liz. Yeah, we want to focus a little bit on what you probably already know. And for some of you, um, I assume that you've been following some of this data through the COVID um, pandemic. But this is really the data on um, the experience that we've had in our community about who's actually, um, who's had COVID. So our population is 71% um, white, 16% Latino, 6% um, Asian, 3% African American, and 4% other. And yet our cases are 67% in the, um, in the Hispanic Latino community, 24% in the white community, um, and su surprisingly uh, less than 3% in the African American community is what we have experienced. Similarly, you can look at the hospitalization rates and the death rates, and I just want to talk a little bit about why we're seeing that. Um, population, clearly we understand that better. Case rates, the 67% is actually significantly down from what it was about a month ago. We were probably closer to 77, 78% um, in our, our Latinx community. And really, I mean, we are, this disease has most effect, impacted our Latinx community. And it's because of a lot of the things that we've talked about around housing, around essential workers. Um, people have, in the Canal District, live in very tight quarters. And so when we would have one case in, in an apartment, it would very quickly sp spread to 10 or 11 or 12 other people. And so we've really put a lot of services in place that I'll talk about shortly about how do we stop that spread. Additionally, the people in the canal generally are people that are providing the essential services in our community. So we have all stayed healthy on the backs of our Latinx community. And that's an awful, an awful reality. I hate, I hate to say that out loud, but it's very true. People have not had the option of working from home. People have had not had the option of staying home when they weren't feeling well. And so this community has continued to go to work in grocery stores and in gas stations and in pharmacies to serve the rest of the county. And they have disproportionately been impacted by this, by this pandemic. Um, now on the death side, I think, um, what you can see is that 16% of our deaths have been in the Latinx community and 71%, which almost identically matches our population. I think one number is off by one percentage point. And it's really because of the age of our population. You know, the average age in Marin County is significantly older than in other Bay Area counties. And the majority of our deaths have come in skilled nursing facilities. And so what's happened is um, our Latinx community who are working in two or three different skilled nursing facilities be to pay the rent because the, they're not high paid high wage jobs. They go into those communities and then it spreads in a skilled nursing facility and that's where we see um, a, a higher, higher um, death count. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that we have done. I think um, we have realized, early on, we realized the disproportionate impact um, on our, our canal community. Um, the expectation was that we would also see a disproportionate impact on our African American community. We have not seen that. We have tried to provide similar level of services in both concentrated communities, but we are certainly seeing that the, um, that the, that the rates are significantly higher in our Latinx community. So, We've done a lot around mass distribution. We've worked with day laborer organizations and construction organizations. Uh, we have worked really closely with our, our community nonprofits. I think I will admit that in the past, I think the county's position, not everyone's uniformly, but was that we were government and we could figure it out and we could do it and we could do it well. And I think the pandemic has made it very clear that we are government and we can do it, but we don't always necessarily do it well. And the, it's really taken the partnership um, with our community nonprofits because people don't trust government in many cases, especially if you're in an, in an undocumented community. And so the idea of engaging it all with government or giving government information about you is not something that people are willing to do, very understandably. 
Um, so we've really partnered with um, the Canal Welcome Center, with Canal Alliance, a multicultural center, sorry, of Marin, um, Alcohol Justice. We've, um, uh, we've really coordinated with those organizations. We've done food distributions, and we're not just doing food distribution in regular food bank settings. We're also doing food distribution to homes. So when somebody is COVID positive, we have set up support so that the person can stay home. We have created an isolation and quarantine fund where we actually pay people who are earning under 300% of the poverty line to, um, we pay them up to $1,500 for two weeks so that they will stay home in quarantine and then we provide food into their homes so that they're not running out to get food or diapers or those types of things, but they're actually having the opportunity to isolation, isolate and quarantine. The interesting thing about food distribution, um, you know, we think of Marin as very well off and we certainly, in general, a lot of the population is fairly well off. The food distribution, I think Liz can speak to this, but it was people that, had, <laughs> people that had never been in a food distribution line were in food distribution lines. You know, you had a Mercedes Benz pulling up in a line and they were like, I've never done this before, how do I get food? And I think um, typically the county doesn't step into a food distribution place. And we had distribution sites all over the county in partnership with um, the food bank because um, people were really struggling. And so we really tried to fill that gap. We've also had a variety of um, housing opportunities. So we've, ex we've um, housed people experiencing homelessness. And in the entire pandemic, we've probably had two or three people who are experiencing homelessness um, test positive for COVID, which has just been a, a, a phenomenal success. Um, we've had four different hotels that we have um, leased or rented and run as essentially homeless shelters. And our partnership with our nonprofits there has been phenomenal. Um, we have really supported people to stay inside and to have food. And so that has been something that has been a great success too. I think in, since March, we have housed 27 families that either were homeless prior to COVID starting or were homeless as a result of COVID, and they are all in permanent, either permanent housing or permanent supportive housing in the county of Marin. So I think that that is one of our silver linings. Um, we have really focused on translation and ASL in a way that we have never done it before. In our town halls, we make sure that we have ASL interpreters and Spanish language interpreters, but we've also realized that it's not as easy as that, right? It's not just the Spanish language. It's our native languages. It's, um, it's Russian. It's Vietnamese. It's really working to make sure that the, the services and information that we're putting out is delivered in all in different languages that our community needs. So we've really worked to do that. Um, we've provided free testing, and we're really focused on the community, this community of high prevalence. So we right now have two... 60 a week testing sites in the Canal District, one at Marin Community Clinics and one at LHI, which is a state-sponsored site, and it's located at the West America Bank. It's free to anyone that um, needs a test. Um, MCC is really limited to people that have MCC or have medical services through MCC. Um, but we are committed. We had we started early testing with Canal Alliance, and lines would form around the block of people ready to get tested at six o'clock in the morning, and we didn't start testing until noon on any day. So, people, we re we really got information out, and people were really committed to testing, which was um, which was pretty great. And that's really a way that we can stop the spread of of this um, this virus. Um, we have rental assistance and emergency other emergency funding. Um, the rental assistance, we put in about $2.6 million into that fund. Marin Community Foundation was part of that funding opportunity. Um, and that, didn't, that wasn't based on whether you had COVID or not. It was simply based on the fact that many people were out of work for months. I mean, some, um, I think of personal services providers that traditionally are women-owned businesses in communities of color, so nail salons, that type of thing. I mean, they were literally just allowed to open a couple of weeks ago, and so had not worked since the beginning of March. Uh, we have a canal outbreak plan committee um, where we have included members of City of San Rafael and people from all across the community, and we are working on um, videos and outreach documents and events and flu, flu events and really making sure that anything that comes up through the community, community that we're able to respond to it quickly 
Um, and we are seeing a reduction in the positivity in the canal. I will say in those same two census blocks that Liz pointed out and that were also in the earlier presentation, those are the census blocks that we have had the absolute highest outbreaks. And in some cases, there were days where we were testing and it was over 50% in those, in those two census blocks. Um, we are certainly decreasing. We, um, the last number I saw was in the around 20%. Um, but that is decreasing on a daily basis as well about how many people we have positive in the canal when we test every day. Um, we're also reaching out really daily to our, our skilled nursing facilities. It's a very vulnerable population, but we have daily check-ins. And as soon as there is a positive in any one of those environments, we are in those environments um, really working um, to make sure we can stop the outbreak. We've started pop-up child care. We started that in March for essential workers, so employees that were actually in hospitals and providing essential services, they had a place to take their kids. Um, we have hired a whole bunch of folks that we, through the nonprofit organizations. So instead of hiring through our traditional means of hiring county employees to do the work, we recognize that our county, our community partners were going to be the ones that serve, deliver the services the best. So we've hired culturally competent contact investigators and care navigators, where instead of somebody having to talk to the county about their services, they can actually talk to somebody that they're familiar with in their community who can help to make sure that they get the testing they need, they get the treatment they need, and they get the financial resources that they need. We also started a very broad um, Wi-Fi access project in the canal, and that project is actually also extending to Marin City, really focused on education and on kids' access. So many kids did not have access. Um, we went distance learning in March, and there were many kids that could not participate in distance learning because they didn't have Wi-Fi access. So we distributed hundreds of um, hotspots, and now we've actually built a Wi-Fi network in the canal community. Uh, we have small business grants, and we've also had business partnerships with grocery stores and restaurants. I think keeping our eye on the fact that people that have to go to work every day are the ones that are at most risk of getting this virus, and we need to support them as a community to make sure that they get the services that they need. Also yesterday, which isn't on my slide, the state announced an equity um, indicator so that you will not be allowed to move any further into reopening unless you, are pro you can prove that you are providing equitable access to treatment and testing um, for your, the, the poorest in your community. So I'm really excited about that equity initiative. Um, I think it's going to hold counties accountable and make sure that just because communities in, let's say, Ross are doing well and not seeing a high, um, prob the high, high uh, positivity rate, that we're thinking about the, the communities that are not having that same experience. So I'm excited about that equity um, initiative. So just a couple of things that we've learned. Um, there are more new voices than ever before, and it is amazing, and it is scary sometimes, and we, um, at our board meetings, they are hours long every week, and we are hearing from people that are excited and want to be active in the community, and we are really working to, to engage those folks and to make sure that they can help us create stronger government. Um, we can't do it alone. I think we've, I've never known this more clearly than I know it now, that partners, we don't do everything well. That's not our expertise and really counting on the people that do things well and provide services and have trust networks built in their community. Uh, we need to partner with them in order to provide services. Every community that we have worked with, is, it's all different. Our West community, our West Marin community is completely different than our Marin City community, is completely different than our Southern Nevada community, is completely different than our Canal community. And we have learned that it's not a partnership with one nonprofit organization. It's a partnership in each of those places, building a system that will work for people. What our farm workers need in West Marin is completely different than what our Canal employees need as they're going to a grocery store. So we're really, really conscious of building a system, uh, building a testing system. In, in West Marin, we've built it through with Coastal Health Alliance. And it's a trusted healthcare partner in West Marin, and people are willing to go there and get tested. In the Canal District, they were really comfortable coming to, people were really comfortable coming to Canal Alliance. And so when we built that testing model, we were sure, we were really working to make sure that we were meeting people's needs. And then 
it seems a little depressing or I don't know, maybe um, there are silver linings in COVID that I just don't want to lose sight of. Number one, I think our partnerships across the, our organization and across um, the community are so much stronger today than they ever have been. Um, I think about housing our homeless population. We have had opportunities to house folks that we have never had before. And um, I just think that we really need to capitalize on the fact that we're working together better. That we, I've never been to a one TAM meeting before. And I hope that what, it, what we are launching is an opportunity for us to work more closely um, together and to be better as a community because I think that's what our community needs from us and that's what um, I think we all expect of ourselves as well. Liz, do you have? I, I see Janet looking right out there with her <laughs> one hand face. So I'm not, but I just want to reiterate the fact that we did, we really did learn an awful lot. I learned that, and while I've been doing community liaison work, I've learned that, guess what, everybody? There are over 5,500 African Americans who live in Marin County, of which less than 800 live in Marin City. How's that for a mind-blowing change, right? When you check your assumptions about our communities. And so COVID has given us an opportunity to look at our communities in very different ways. And to Angela's point, partner with them and create much stronger bonds and relationships that I think will help us through the next emergency crisis. One other thing I guess I wanted to add is I, I talked a lot about COVID, but now we're in fires um, and we're in PSPS. And, um, still a lot to learn and still a lot to prepare for. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And the Woodward fire um, was a, a really good reminder. And that fire is still burning, actively burning out in West Marin. And um, there were eight to 10 feet gulches that hadn't burned in years. And those will continue to burn probably until we get good rain. So, you know, as we're moving into, as we're in actually a red, red flag day today and tomorrow, and it's supposed to be excessively hot. Um, you know, how do we continue to serve our community? How do we get our community ready? We're really focused on that from an emergency response perspective. Thank you so much. Um, Liz and Angela for so much excellent information. We meant to throw these polls up right at the start. Um, so do you spend any time in Marin City or have you had any experience with the communities that we were just speaking about? And look at that, we have a lot of folks who have never spent much time there at all. And only 3% of our attendees live there. So we're going to ask the same question now about the Canal neighborhood in San Rafael. And then we're going to go to the big reveal. The same answer, right? We've got a lot of folks who um, are not particularly familiar with that area. Um, so I think a first step um, in solving some of these problems is, is to make these communities places that you know firsthand. Um, so um, as we head into the break, um, instead of doing a Q&A with Liz and Angela, we've got some really, really excellent questions. I'm going to take one of those questions that was submitted in the Q&A and I'm going to turn around and pose it to you in the audience. Um, and we're going to try to use the Nearpod tool again. So um, Gracia, if you could put into the chat um, first the website, the, the link for how to get yourself back into Nearpod using um, your web browser. And then um, to deal with the cap on the number of people who can get in, we're going to ask that if your name begins with the letters A through K, your last name, that you use the first code that Gracia is going to put into the chat. And if your name is from L to Z, that you use the second code. And that, here we go. They're showing up in the, showing up in the uh, chat right now. And the question for you 
is what does your community need, need you to be um, in this moment? And um, I'm going to give you a few minutes to try to figure that out. Um, and then we are going to take a short break. And we are going to resume again at 1045. And um, for the many questions that I'm seeing in the chat um, over and over again are um, that these presentations are so great, so amazing, so um, information rich. People want to um, be able to get a hold of the slides and a recording of the presentations, and we will be doing that. Um, it might take, because we're running the, this as a series every single week, it's gonna take us a little while to post process and get that up to you, but rest assured that we will get that to you. Um, and um, we're also gonna um, assemble all of the questions that we have, we'll provide them to the speakers and we'll have a conversation with them about what we'll do, about kind of going into a Q&A with that. Um, in a different um, setting and format. So again, please uh, give it a shot on the Nearpod, and I am, and then uh, come back at 10:45 for the, our next speakers. Thank you so much, Angela and Liz. I really appreciate. It. Thank you. Thank you.